Well, good morning. Welcome everyone attending this online workshop on advances, challenges and trends in toxicology. It's my honor to open this event organized by the group of animal toxins at the University of Sao Paulo in Ribeirão Preto and supported by the graduate program in toxicology at the same university, CAPS and FAPESP. As speakers today, we have renowned toxicologist, Dr. Jan Tittigat from the University of Louvain in Belgium, Dr. Michael Ashner from the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in the US, and Dr. Monica Pauliello, also from the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in the US. Thanks, Dr. Tittigat, Dr. Ashner, and Dr. Pauliello for sharing your scientific knowledge with us today. I hope everyone enjoyed this event. So, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, like Professor Fernando said, uh, our first speaker is Professor Jan Titget. Uh, Jan is full professor and head of the Laboratory of Toxicology and Pharmacology at the Catholic University of Leuven in Belgium. Uh, he holds a bachelor's, a bachelor's and master's degree in pharmaceutical sciences and continued his career by obtaining a PhD in physiology at the Medical School of Kaiulova and then a postdoc at the Medical University uh, of ha Harvard's Medical University. Uh, he, he holds the chair of toxicology and pharmacology at Kaiulova uh, with tuition and research in different areas of toxicology. Uh, in the faculties of medicine, pharmaceutical, and bioagricultural uh, sciences. Uh, and today, he will present the lecture entitled Detection of Novel Psychoactive, uh, Psychoactive Substances, Current Challenges. Thanks, Jan. Bom dia a todos. Uh, good morning, everybody. I hope you can understand and see me. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers. It's an honor and also pleasure being able to contribute, um, also given the long-standing collaboration with Professor Eliane uh, Arantes. So it's a true pleasure um, presenting you. Uh, good morning, everybody. I will screen, I will show my screen, first of all, I would like to thank but I hear a kind of hollow, I don't know whether this is uh, depending on the internet, so at least I'm looking at you because I hear myself speaking, let's say with 30, 30 seconds delay. Yeah, 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 I don't know what is happening in either. Uh, do you have a uh, uh, YouTube screen open on your computer? I don't know whether this is depending on the internet. Okay, so uh, yes, I unless so I closed now on uh, a YouTube window, maybe now the, the yeah, the so I, I think now. Okay. Yeah, I think now it's going to be okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Don't forget to share your screen as well for the. Yes, I will now uh, indeed share the screen and start my presentation. Okay, I hope you can see uh, my screen and also hear me. Again, it's a pleasure to um, talk to you today about the detection of uh, the new psychoactive substances and what are our current uh, challenges in this domain. I do this um, out of, let's say, my daily experience as forensic toxicologist, where uh, in Belgium we work as scientists and experts at the request of the Ministry of Justice. So this gives, of course, a feeling what is happening outside in the world in terms of um, the trends with these NPSs or new active substances. And to start off, we have to realize that on a daily basis, we get really overwhelmed with very complicated uh, names, um, some examples are shown here, abbreviations, and um, many people don't realize what's behind, of course, all these uh, scientific names or abbreviations. So when we talk about new psychoactive substances, today there is a kind of 
flag we have to raise and say, help, um, how can we, let's say, uh, deal with this? And I will briefly um, touch some le legislation and the judicial challenges we face in this area, but more importantly, also detection. Uh, what can we as toxicologists, let's say, deliver uh, helping society in terms of the analytical challenges uh, to be uh, overcome? As an introduction, very briefly, what is a new psychoactive substance? What is an NPS? What is the link with designer drugs and with legal highs? Because these are the three main uh, definitions uh, we have to remember today. A new psychoactive substance, NPS, uh, can be called a novel substance with psychotropic activity. So we do not talk about, let's say, a new antibiotic. No, it has to have a psychotropic activity. And importantly, it doesn't fall under the UN conventions of 1961 and 1971. That's a kind of milestone. So if it doesn't fall under these, let's say, lists of the UN, uh, but it does pose a problem for public health nowadays, comparable with illicit substances with limited therapeutic value, then uh, we agreed, then it is called an NPS. What is then a designer drug that we hear about? Well, a designer drug, as the name it says, it's something that has been designed. So in practice, it means it's again a psychoactive substance that is produced on the basis of a chemical precursor or several precursors used in illegal labs. And the substance is thus designed by modifying a chemical structure of an existing, sometimes illicit drug. And the main purpose is to uh, bypass the legislation such that if, let's say, the producers are being caught, they cannot be prosecuted because it's a legal activity. Now, when we encounter designer drugs, often we deal with imitation rather than innovation. And then the third definition, what is a legal high? Well, a legal high can be a synthetic or vegetable substance. It's often sold via internet. Uh, so a legal high can be a designer drug. It can be an NPS. Sometimes they, uh, let's say, uh, overlap. But legal highs usually are marketed with aggressive and ingenious advertisement uh, strategy. For instance, all the synthetic uh, cannabis molecules. So very easy access uh, via internet and a credit card to, to buy and chip. And sometimes they are intentionally mislabeled with uh, alleged ingredients not corresponding to the actual composition. Peter, so uh, your uh, screen is on to uh, moving. Let's. <laughs> I think you have to. Kelly, talvez ele não tenha compartilhado a tela inteira. Agora está aparecendo, não? Não. Você me ajuda aqui, Yara? Ops, não. Estou Is this a window or full screen window and then a tablet? Full screen, full screen. Full screen is this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, then share. Okay. And now okay. I have to go, go back to the, the PowerPoint. Presentation list there. Go to the presentation mode. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Huh? It's okay, no. <laughs> Should I repeat from uh, I think it's not necessary, yeah. you can continue. Okay, so sorry for the logistic problem. It seems to be um, solved now because I understood you could not, let's say, follow the next slides I was presenting. But I hope you can see now the definition of legal high. So I summarize again, it's a synthetic or vegetable substance often sold via internet. It's usually marketed via aggressive, ingenious advertisement. Sometimes it's intentionally mislabeled with alleged ingredients not corresponding to the actual composition. And depending on the country, the legal status is not always uh, guaranteed. So what are the current challenges in terms of legislation worldwide? Well, you have to imagine that uh, most countries were faced with the fact that when a new 
psychoactive substances appeared on the market and it was not, let's say, in the uh, law or decrees of a particular country, it was considered legal and no prosecution was possible. So many countries have now adopted a kind of generic list approach where at the same time in one decree or one uh, law, um, a whole, let's say, family of NPS molecules is, is uh, let's say, um, controlled and that's definitely a good solution. Eh? So we are there, I say, mission, mission accomplished and I will simply give a brief example of, for instance, my own country where we have, uh, we are a, a kingdom, so we have royal decrees where um, we have in our um, decrees now an overview where the legislator has used annexes and these annexes uh, represent generic lists encompassing all these NPSs. And I'll give some brief example. So in the annexes, you see here an example of some molecules, some famous ones with fentanyl derivatives, as you can see here. Um, and um, next slide, here also a, a second annex with, for instance, the catinones, uh, DMT, MDMA, which is ecstasy, mescaline. Um, but more than this, they also emphasize now on particular NPS families, for instance, with the well-known benzodiazepines that are prescribed drugs eh, with medical, let's say, uh, interest, but also becoming more and more abused. And here also the whole family of the benzodiazepines in a kind of genetic list is uh, controlled. And in terms of chemistry, also, if you look at the amphetamines, the, let's say the, the benefit from countries that have adopted genetic lists in their, let's say, law and decrees, is that now, um, let's say, basic structure of the propane amine structure is, let's say, illicit, and they uh, highlight R1, R2, R3 substitutes, um, where you can see all types or the different types of, um, let's say, uh, modifications of this molecule at the same time becomes illegal. And this, let's say, helps us to, um, let's say, uh, be ahead of new NPSs on the market and that people still can claim they are legal. So for the amphetamines, this is done in many countries now, the generic lists. For the catinones, eh, the catinones are very comparable to amphetamines, but they have a carbonyl here. Then also the fentanyl derivatives in many countries are now, um, let's say, controlled in generic uh, lists. Fentanyl, you have to know, is a big, big problem. Um, for instance, in Northern America, in Europe, in Canada, because it's considered as a heroin uh, substitute and it's a very, very potent uh, molecule. Then the synthetic cannabinoids, just the same. Um, many, many types of synthetic cannabinoids have been uh, on the market. They are widely misused. And also here we have generic lists that help us to, to uh, restrict the use and the, the sales. Also for the tryptamines, the piperazines, um, so these are simple examples of genetic lists and that's, I think, in terms of legislation, the way uh, to go. And then in the last annex, we see some uh, different types of molecules here, GBL, which is gamma butyrolactone and also butandiol, and they are specially, let's say, controlled in many countries. Why? Because they are famous precursors for this GHB, uh, gamma, gamma hydroxybutyrate, which is also called liquid ecstasy and it's really an, an important uh, date rape drug. So when you combine it with alcohol, um, it's, it becomes in a synergistic way very dangerous. So that's also uh, illicit, of course. So what do we know today? Well, I can show you a very, very recent, let's say, update from the European Monitoring Centre of Drugs and Drugs of Addiction. You see it's from June 2022. And they have, um, let's say, summarized the state of the art of 25 years of early warning uh, in Europe. And what we can learn from this, let's say, statistics is when we talk about NPSs, that you can see that the phenomenon has started since, let's say, 2000. And then we have known a maximum around 2014, 2015. And now they have not disappeared, no, but it seems that the peak is somewhat uh, over. 52 NPSs have been reported for the first time in 2021. And in total, more than 880 molecules eh, are currently monitored. So we are not talking about one or two or 10 molecules. No, no, it's really a lot. And how do you 
classify them? Well, it's very diverse. Huh? We have to pay attention to the so-called amino indanes, aryl alkyl amines, aryl cyclohexyl amines, then the benzodiazepines, the cannabinoids, the catinones, the opioids, others. It can be a medication that is used now as precursor, the phenylethyl amines, the piperazines, the piperidines, indoalkyl amines, and then plants and extracts. So you see, in terms of chemistry, this poses a lot of challenges to detect to identify also the metabolites thereof. If you have an overdose and let's say um, an, um, the pathologist delivers samples from a deceased person, you will really have a challenge as toxicologist to, uh, let's say, identify all these uh, new substances. What about the quantity and the numbers? Also here from the European uh, survey from last month, you see that 20, 1,200 seizures uh, amounting more than 5.1 tons of NPS only in Europe already have been seized, so that's that's uh, quite important. Um, we can only hope that the peak that let's say was around 2015 is over. However, in 2020 we still we saw again a rise in terms of seizures. So the problem probably is not over yet, and we have to stay uh, vigilant. How let's say does this become known to the general public? Well, I have to refer to a rather famous scientist, uh, Alexander Shulgin, and he published um, yeah, two books that are fully available as PDFs on the internet. One is called PICAL, so the phenyl ethyl amines I always loved and liked. It's like an uh, acronym. And then also TICAL for the more, let's say, um, uh, hallucinogenic molecules. And he describes uh, together with his wife here, um, how to make these molecules, what the doses, what the risks are, the chemical the pathways, uh, precursors. So it's no wonder in a certain way that um, yeah, enthusiasts or people with bad intentions to make a lot of money um, can have easy access to uh, the precursors, to the chemicals and reaction uh, schemes. And this was, of course, much different in the pre era of uh, when Internet was not, uh, let's say, available. We also see some, I would call them rather malafide, uh, let's say, actors on the scene where people really know very well how far they can go in terms of legislation in their own country. And then they have these uh, internet sites, sometimes in the dark net, and you can pay these, uh, let's say, the, the substances, the NPSs with, with uh, bitcoins, as you know. So it's a whole, let's say, uh, almost separate world of activity where scientists and forensic toxicologists should be aware of. And uh, this um, here is, is uh, an example of Dr. Z, the inventor of Methadrone, which is an NPS now illegal, that he was really selling from uh, UK worldwide. So that's about the legislation and the general introduction. What about now the chemistry and the challenges? Because we talk about yeah, new structures, uh, new precursors, uh, metabolites, how can we deal with this? Huh? So it really uh, poses an analytical challenge. And to address this, I thought to give you a very, let's say, kind of uh, schematic and colored overview, how we approach this uh, as uh, analytical toxicologists. And if we start with the phenyl ethyl amines, please remember that you have three moieties in such molecule. You have the, the blue, the ring, then you have the ethyl, let's say bridge, and then the amine group in red. And then you can see the well-known amphetamine, which is not an NPS because it's yeah, already on the market uh, and included in this UN convention of 61 and 72. So the amphetamine is a classical example of the phenyl amine. And then you can see when we talk of the methylene dioxy, which is called the love drug, you have here this um, additional ring on the blue moiety. Then the famous methamphetamine, which is a big problem in Northern America, um, where they also have converted um, medication into methamphetamine. Uh, let's say Mr. White and Breaking Bad, the, the well-known TV series. It's all about uh, production of this molecule. And then they simply have, let's say, substituted the amine function with a methyl. But then also dangerous uh, newer amphetamines like paramethoxy amphetamine, even when the structure is very alike amphetamine, it's still, in terms of pharmacology and kinetics, it has a much different uh, effect with a higher risk of, let's say, hypertension and uh, uh, overdose. 
But the most well-known of all worldwide is the MDMA, which is uh, synonymous for the ecstasy or uh, ecstasy, where you have the methylene dioxy and then methamphetamine. So this MDMA is a kind of combination, in fact, of MDA and then the methamphetamine. And this is the number one, let's say, uh, popular drug to go to festivals uh, and dance clubs uh, because it gives you both um, stimulation, euphoria, and also a mild hallucination uh, effect. Is this the only possibility? No, unfortunately. We can also see these days in terms of NPSs, a lot of new molecules arising where then the emphasis is on the ring substitution, like 2CB is a notorious one. It's very much liked. People who use it are very pleased with the pharmacological effects. So it's a bromo uh, methoxy substituted uh, ring, derivative of a PEA. It can also be an iodine. It can be an, uh, a methyl. It can be like here also a more uh, lipophilic chain. So you see the uh, possibilities are endless. A very dangerous one I want to emphasize today are what we called called the Enboma series, the Enbomi, um, standing for like um, methoxy, uh, N-butyl, let's say, phenylethylamine derivative. So here you see now people have heavily modified the red moiety and sometimes also at the same time the blue ring substitution. And this give, give, gives them rise to notorious molecules like the 25C and BOME, so with the chlorine, or the 25B with the bromine, or with the iodine. And why do I want to emphasize this type of NPSs in particular today? Well, in my opinion, experience is these are the newest, let's say, LSDs of today. Uh, these molecules have, let's say, the um, intrinsic uh, activity of being an amphetamine-like or phenylethylamine-like, but they are very hallucinogenic also. And we see less and less LSD abuse, but more and more uh, in the direction of these guys. So we really have to be vigilant about the, uh, let's say, use of the NBOMAS. Others popular are the benzofury family. And then you can see, again, if we take amphetamine as a strategy or, or basic uh, molecule, the, the variations on a theme, eh, you see here the five ring with an N or with an O, um, they are called benzofuris. The catinomas I highlighted already. The catinomas, the only difference with a phenylethylamine is the carbonyl moiety here uh, on the carbon. And the catinomas have become popular some years ago, uh, known as bath salts. So all of a sudden, let me briefly review. So we had in many countries ecstasy MDMA, or so it's also called Adam and MDEA is called EVE. Um, so they were already a long time illicit, eh? they were banned, illegal. And then all of a sudden we saw the appearance of, let's say, the carbonyl variant. And in the beginning they were not controlled and they were very popular. Eh? They were on the market, uh, let's say, sprayed on, uh, let's say, harmful, uh, not harmful uh, leaves, but then sprayed synthetically, or they were available in capsules and powders. And the analysis showed that they had this carbonyl derivative of MDMA, which is called methylone or ethylone or butylone, and they were sold as bad salts. And they were very active, and fortunately, um, they are not legal anymore. So even when some internet sites still uh, sell them as uh, legal highs or designer drugs, uh, be aware that in most countries nowadays they have become illegal. Uh, so it's forbidden to use or to sell. So again, the catinones, I refer to my blue, black and red representation of these molecules. You see some examples, eh? uh, four MMC, um, and here also stereoisomers exists. So you have also two and three MMC. And from an analytical point of view, it's not always easy to uh, unit evocally, let's say, determine. You have flephedrone, three flephedrone, methedrone, methylone. So they're all on the market. Then you have the true hallucinogenics with, of course, the tryptamine. Mm -hmm. um, this moiety here in blue is very reminiscent to have an action in our brain with hallucinogenic actions. And um, 
You have the classic ones like dimethyltryptamine, but also derivatives eh, for uh, o acetylated 5-methoxy. Five, five so again, also in this class, um, the choices are, let's say, rich to still produce new NPSs. With respect to these um, tryptamine derivatives, there is a nice, let's say, um, connection to nature. Eh? If I can show here the bufotenin here, bufotenin is an effective kind of toxin produced uh, in the secretions of the toad, eh? bufo, it's, it's an animal at the toad. And um, historically, people have, let's say, used toad secretions to become in trance, to have a kind of euphoric uh, feeling. And you can see that um, also molecules like psilocybin, that is a naturally occurring alkaloid in the uh, mushrooms, that this has been inspirational for NPSs, synthetic ones, man-made. Uh, they look very much uh, alike uh, what nature produces. The same is true for the harman, harmalin and harmin alkaloids, um, the uh, ayahuasca therapy, and let's say uh, rites that uh, are popular in Latin America um, deal with these type of molecules, where then if you, uh, let's say, follow such an ayahuasca session, you have inhibitors of the monoamine oxidases and then the cocktail uh, of, um, let's say, psychoactive molecules reinforces uh, the effects. The synthetic cannabinoids, um, here the most popular, in my opinion, is spice. You can buy it from the internet. So you see, an, uh, let's say, not harmful um, leaf that is sprayed quite often in, in countries like somewhere in Asia, and then it's sold via internet at a fairly reasonable price. Um, and um, initially, the synthetic cannabinoids where I show an example of HU210, they had a kind of resemblance to what Mother Nature produces in the plant, THC, eh, tetrahydrocannabinol. But nowadays, um, we encounter in daily life many synthetic cannabinoids um, belonging to groups, as you can see here on the right, where the structure is already much, much, let's say, different from the original THC. Is it then placebo, you can ask? No, no, it's very active. Um, it can be active on the cannabis CB1 receptor, but also it can be more non-selective and act at the same time on particular ion channels. Uh, it can also work on serotonin receptors. So this is the, let's say, the pharmacological feature and also danger of these synthetic cannabinoids. They are being vaped, they are being smoked, injected, taken orally, um, but they are very popular for the moment. What can you expect from synthetic cannabinoids? I take a, an, a very nice wheel from the European Monitoring Centrum uh, of Drugs and Abuse, so you can also find this on the internet. But it shows in a nice, and colored fashion, what we still can expect uh, in terms of novel or new psychoactive substances from this class. So you see you have a ring and the choices are ample in purple. You have a linker, you have a core, and then a more hydrophobic tail. And you don't need to be an Einstein or Statisticus uh, to see if you combine all these four moieties, uh, how many uh, new NPSs belonging to the synthetic cannabinoids we still can expect. But fortunately, again, in terms of legislation, we can say that several of these um, are banned, illegal, thanks to these generic lists. So we have to warn, warn people who have, let's say, not good intentions of making uh, new synthetic cannabis, that many of them uh, will already be illegal at the start. A trend we see um, more and more is that people start to use registered medication that of course needs a prescription from a, a physician and it can be an antidepressant like trazodone which is a piperazin it can be a benzodiazepine it can be an antipsychotic it can be an, a strong opioid uh, narcotic analgesic this is really a new trend in nps's so people start from a medication and then they uh, let's say do uh, the designer drug approach and they substitute the basic molecules. Um, and in this way, we can consider existing medication as precursors. The case for trazodone is a bit particular. When you take trazodone, 
let's say medically, let's say um, uh, justified, our body makes a famous metabolite. It's called MCPP, and this is an active metabolite from the mother molecule, as you can see. And what we see in the um, drugs scene is that people use MCPP by itself. Right? So they take the metabolite as a drug uh, from the start. Here you see some examples for these piperazine molecules, what um, substitutions have been on the market, and they are called MCP, CPP, MCPP, then the para uh, substituents, ometoxy, parametoxy, and so forth. So also here, at these four uh, substitution locations, you can expect many uh, new psychoactive substances. And then the case of the GBL, and then the gamma hydroxybutyrate, so this is GBL. Here the, it's a bit difficult to, to um, ban the molecule. Why? Because it has a worldwide um, use to clean here the tires uh, and the wheels of cars and trucks. And the, this gives rise to the fact that people um, buy GBL. They convert it with sodium hydroxide in their own, let's say, kitchen then you can produce easily GHB, and then of course it's being sold or it's being uh, used. So this is the chemical route that we often uh, see, and that's the reason why also GBL as a precursor is now uh, illegal and scheduled. Some, I would say, stupid people take GBL as such, orally. Um, this is very dangerous. Oops. Oops. Sorry. Go back to. I have to go back. Uh, to yeah, and I think it's open on your PowerPoint. Uh, one of the windows open for your PowerPoint. Okay. The okay, second one. Yeah. 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 Thank you. So, um, some people abuse the GBL by itself, uh, and that. Can you follow? Yes. Oops. No. Okay. And then they um, count on the metabolic route to um, yeah, produce GBH in the body itself. But this is very toxic because the GBL is uh, corrosive and then they end up in the hospital. A brief uh, figure from the um, United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. Um, if you see here the number of NPSs per group uh, detected some years ago, you can see that the stimulants are very popular, that the synthetic cannabinoids, so those two classes uh, are definitely taking the lead. The hallucinogens are third, and then you have the sedatives, dissociatives, and then opioids, and then definite, definitely also some others not yet assigned. Okay, coming more now to the analytics and also the hospital, um, we have to realize that people in intensive care units um, uh, in the hospitals, yeah, they, they face with new syndromes. So, an um, somebody is brought to the intensive care, has a particular serotonin syndrome or uh, anticholinergic syndrome, um, how to deal with that if you later um, observe it's an overdose of an NPS. So the challenge for the physicians and the all uh, everybody working in the um, intensive care units is, is very high. And from a toxicological point of view, we have to help with the analytical identification. And a particular uh, report that I found interesting to present today is from the uh, or a project called EPS NPS and EPS stands for enhancing policy skills in the field of uh, new psychoactive substances. And this was a, a European funded project that uh, uh, took several years with several partners. And the, the, the purpose is helping people to recognize and identify NPSs for enforcement, like police, but also in a broader term for forensic purposes. And the, all the information is also available on the internet. You will see a brief introduction on the challenges of the NPSs, the practices of handling and analyzing NPSs, and then some recommendations. And I will briefly give um, a summary. When we deal with NPSs, um, what are the challenges? So in A, you can see they are not homogeneous, um, and there is an ambiguous legal status. So the challenge is the investigation and the control. 
they occur rapidly and also transiently on the market. So we really need to be able to rapidly identify them. They can be disguised in mixed compositions. So how to control, how to recognize. Often they are in unsuspected packaging. So also for the custom, um, the recognition is important. And they're quite often traf traded and trafficked in small quantity by internet and post. So again, there is a need for proper control and identification. What are the issues today with NPSs? Well, the reference material. Eh? Um, most people, including myself, active in this field, we uh, lack reference material to identify the NPSs to um, have a proper dosage. Um, so the main problems are the availability, the costs, the access, uh, reference material. Then the reporting. The reporting is not always uniform worldwide, so that can be increased or uh, improved. The awareness, um, there is still a lack of knowledge of current trends in NPSs. There is insufficient expertise and experience in the identification. Uh, also, the interpretation of mass spectra is not uh, easy, definitely when you consider also uh, metabolites. Literature, okay, literature is growing, we have to acknowledge, um, but as compared to the classical literature about overdoses of ecstasy, cocaine, heroin, um, literature is still scarce. Validated methods and analytical techniques, there is still kind of lack um, and it's not easy to have access to validated analytical methods if you, uh, let's say, in your own lab want to establish a protocol. So there are recommendations from this uh, Enhancing Policy Skill NPS program. We need to facilitate exchange in the EU and worldwide, of course, of standards of NPS. We need to promote harmonization in the EU of standard operating procedures for NPSs encourage research on NPS, what are the metabolites, what are precursors, what are the relevant molecules in this domain. And we, uh, or this was the, uh, let's say, uh, recommendation from this EU-based project, uh, create a GEM-based informatic database on NPS, where, for instance, and perhaps this is a bit small to read, but the, the, the idea is when you're an accredited lab or institute, university, and you take part in this research, that you then have access with passwords to databases that show you uh, very valuable analytical data like mass spectra, fragments, um, uh, other names of molecules, and that you can use uh, in the, let's say, confidential environment, this uh, data you see here. Huh? So that, that's that definitely something we have to work, ideally worldwide, not only in uh, Europe. Okay, and for the last maybe five uh, or ten minutes, I will uh, summarize with let's say, through uh, science, mass spectrometry, I think in um, NPS and toxicology, and the challenge we face is the answer. I always say to my students when I teach, um, if you have an interest in mass spectrometry, you will have a job and you will be able to yeah, discover so many, let's say, structures and entities and molecules in forensic toxicology, but also in, in drug discovery in general. And I have to pay tribute um, to um, this person, uh, Thompson, um, in 1906. He was, in fact, the inventor, in my opinion, of mass spectrometry, where he let's say, constructed a, a cathode ray tube, which is really the, the start of the mass spectrometry. And you have to remember the ideal combination of, let's say, a um, mass and that can carry a charge, so mass over charge, this is the essence um, that Thomson used to um, let pass and deflect in a kind of electric and magnetic way. Eh? So you have Y, X, Z. The field free region is the Z, but then the electrical and the magnetic field deflects a particular mass over charge, and then um, the result is being photographed on this plate. So this was his, let's say, invention back in 1906. It was then exactly 100 years ago, um, let's say more professionalized at that time by um, Francis William Ashton. Ashton, you see here the very, very original mass spectrometer. Um, and you see over the last 100 years how it has been, let's say, developed and professionalized. So what is the basic of mass spectrometry to be able to identify all these NPSs precursors, metabolites. Well, in my opinion, it's mass spectrometry, and I will not dwell on that too much. You have to ionize, of course, 
the molecule you want to um, investigate. You have different ionization methods and sources, chemical ionization, atmospheric pressure, electron impact. These are the most, electros pay also the most uh, popular ones, but then you have also MALDI and other ones. Then you have the mass analyzer itself. I will dwell on that a bit later. And then the detection of the ions where it can be quite often an electron uh, multiplier. So also in my lab and in several labs in forensic toxicology, you can use electron impact ionization and chemical impact ionization. And what is the basic difference? Well, it's, it's fairly easy. In electron impact, as you can see here, um, there is in fact a beam of electrons passing through a gas phase sample and that collides with a neutral analyte. So then the molecule M gets this um, yes, charge. And then in the second step, you have then the fragmentation. If you follow the chemical impact ionization, you will first, let's say, activate a reagent gas, R, and then this gas is then later on reacting with your molecule. And then it also gives some fragments. And you can have this spectra that are different. And yeah, sometimes you have to uh, consider for your particular analyte what the best uh, ionization uh, uh, yields will give. The quadruple mass analyzer is the most, let's say, common one, the most basic and also most simple one. So it uh, consists of four parallel rods, as you can see here. And again, the principle, uh, like 100 years ago, remains the same. Remember, you have three uh, or vectors, in, sec in fact, X, Y, Z, um, and you have a deflection of mass over charge uh, based on an electrical and a magnetic field. And this is then the way how to, let's say, uh, yeah, separate and identify your uh, molecules or moieties and fragments. More specialized these days are so-called the TOF analyzers, the time of flight. And here the essence is, yeah, you have a fairly big, let's say, space um, where you let fly um, as a function of mass over charge, particular um, masses and or, or um, molecules over charge. And then depending on their characteristics, they um, fly a particular, let's say, time and distance on the basis of which you can also uh, identify. Interestingly, MSMS-based methods uh, exist. I will not dwell on that too much, but what does it mean? Well, MSMS allows you um, to use valuable information from fragments in combination with the uh, mother, um, let's say, ion. For instance, here you have fragment 129, you allow it in a collision cell, and this fragment again defragments, and then from the collection uh, of all these um, fragments in your second mass spectrometer, you can do a more accurate, um, let's say, elucidation of the structure, um, and this is also now becoming more and more popular. This is from, you see the source. I found it useful um, because it's a very nice overview. If you do MS, MS-based analysis, what choices you have. Eh? You have product ion scan, precursor ion scan, neutral loss scan, and then selective reacting monitoring. And the idea is always very simple. So in the first row here, you have the first mass analyzer. You can select already an M over Z, or you can do a scanning approach. Eh? So it's either of the two. Then you have in the middle, in fact, another uh, collision cell or mass spectrometer that serves in a bit different way. It generates always fragments, um, as you can see here. And then in the second mass analyzer, you again can do scanning, or now you do a selected, uh, let's say, search mass over Z. And these are your choices, and it allows, yeah, for particular um, purposes, the ideal uh, approach in your protocol. Also, in terms of structure biology, and if you relate to drug discovery, um, peptides, enzymes, mass spectrometry has become very, very useful because nowadays you can follow MSMS-based techniques to uh, reveal amino acid sequences where previously the classical Edna degradation was uh, the sole, uh, let's say, way to go. Do we, or can we cope with all challenges? Yes and no, we have to be honest. Even with high resolution mass spectrometry these days, coupled to a, a liquid chromatograph, eh, so LC, liquid chromatograph high resolution MS, we still have to 
realize that even high resolution mass spectrometers cannot always distinguish between, between so called isomeric compounds. For instance, morphine and hydromorphone, yeah, almost eh, exactly the same, same masses, cocaine and scopolamine, hydrocodone and codeine, phentermine and methamphetamine, and then the synthetic cannabinoids that you see here, or the catinones, butylone and ethylone. So there are some challenges uh, where you should be cautious. Um, when you try to interpret particular MS uh, fragments and data. How to solve this? Well, definitely use retention times, try uh, different um, separations in your LC um, to come to a definite identification. So this is still a challenge. To conclude, what is that the comparison in analytical uh, toxicology for these NPSs? Well, most established labs should have, let's say, either GCMS, LCMS, or then LC high resolution MS. The screening, it can be full scan or targeted. The analytes, of course, with GCMS, um, then you talk about small volatile molecules, thermally stable, non-polar. With LCMS, this problem is a bit, let's say, less uh, prominent. You can, of course, then check non-volatile molecules. Uh, resolution, especially fine for the high resolution mass spectrometers, is now very, very uh, good. So it gives you a very nice accuracy. Um, and then you can consult libraries to check uh, what type of molecule you're dealing with. Libraries also become more and more available. Uh, but for NPSs, yeah, we still need regularly updates. Then the analytical identification. Um, for GCMS, you can rely on electron impact, full scan spectra and retention time. For LCMSMS, the fragmentation and retention time. And then the really high, more expensive, high resolution MSs, uh, not only exact mass, but also the isotope pattern uh, can be used uh, for identification together with fragmentation and retention time. This, however, comes at a cost. So GCMS analysis are relatively, let's say, um, cheap, but what is cheap these days? Definitely LCMS and high resolution MS comes at a certain price that is more expensive. And with this, uh, I end. I thank you for your attention. I um, will stop sharing my screen and I will um, give the word back to Ernesto. I remain available, of course, if there are questions. So thanks again for your attention. Yeah, thanks, Jan, for this very interesting talk in this very important and uh, topic these days. Uh, we have some questions from the chat on YouTube. Uh, I will start with the one sent by Julio Cesar, which is also a question that I had. Uh, what do you think that it's the right direction that the legislation uh, need, needs to go about the NPS? Uh, prohibition, regulation and control, and if there are any beneficial uses like the ayahuasca uh, in Latin America? Yes, thanks for the question. Well, I believe that there is a role for the United Nations. Uh, the United Nations uh, Office of Drugs and Crime should try to harmonize all the more local initiatives um, in Europe, in Canada, Northern America, um, also probably in Brazil. We should really aim at a, a harmonized legislation, because otherwise the problem will always, let's say, um, displace to regions where people uh, find a market that is still legal and then the issue is not resolved. So I'm definitely in favor of the United Nations, let's say, initiative. And uh, if needed, we have to yeah, invest more money and people to, to, uh, to reach the goals at that level. Yeah, yeah, indeed, that's true. Uh, thanks. Uh, so the next one from Moserlein Barros. Uh, which are the current clinical prospects for using DMT and psychoelucibin in the clinics? Yes, that's a very, very timely and actual question. I know that um, um, especially for the hallucinogenic compounds, several authors and scientists say how ah, we can medically use them. Well, my, my um, impression is that when physicians um, have to treat, let's say, problematic patients, psychiatric patients, and they do not respond to the classical antipsychotics or antidepressants, then I, I believe with an, uh, an um, informed consent, it is possible to treat those people with what we consider uh, hallucinogenic uh, drugs. But it should always be yeah, 
be done, let's say, under yeah, proper control. Um, so I'm not in favor that people start yeah, using uh, these molecules by themselves without, let's say, um, um, pharmacy included or because of the, 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 yeah, the quality of the product. Yeah, you never can rely as an as a individual what you buy. Um, but if some people really want to do to follow this alternative approach because the classical medication is not helping, in principle, I have nothing against it. Okay, nice, thanks. Uh, and the last one, the last one from Isabella Gobo Ferreira. Uh, she acknowledges you from the presentation, uh, and his her question is: uh, In your opinion, what is the major challenge uh, in the detection of these NPS? Well, also thanks for the question. For me, the major challenge is uh, when you deal with post-mortem toxicology. Ima and I'll, I'll summarize it in the following way. Imagine there is an, a new NPS eh, on the market that we have not really encountered yet. And via classical, let's say, popular festival, people are distributing, they take it, there is an overdose and people die. Then there is an autopsy and in forensic and analytical toxicology, you get then samples from the liver, from blood, serum, etc. And then the task and the challenge is based on metabolites from an unknown mother molecule to discover what was it. So that's really not easy. I can, I think you can understand. And therefore, the newest generations of cutoff instruments and the, the interfaces and software represent a great help. So they are allowing us with all the fragments that we observe to use them as a kind of pieces of a puzzle and reconstruct what a mother, what a mother molecule could have been. And of course, we are we, we know some classical fragmentation patterns to elucidate uh, this must be, let's say, an NPS from the amphetamines or catenones, etc. But still, it's a challenge that forces us to puzzle, to recreate a molecule that has been taken by uh, somebody who got killed, and you don't know what the mother molecule was. So that's a real challenge, but it makes also, in a certain way, life as a scientist uh, very, very, let's say, <laughs> uh, dynamic. Yeah, I can imagine that. That's nice. Uh, and Jan, uh, in this regard, I have a question for myself uh, regarding these kinds of analysis. What are the most frequently used sources of these samples? Like it's always blood, it's tissues from the kidney, like the kidney or liver, like you said. What are the, the most used ones? Well, yeah, the best one should be the brain because there it's a psychotropic substance. So yeah, a kind of biopsy from the brain should be ideal, but it's it's not done, you understand. So we always rely on blood. It can be for, uh, full blood, it can be plasma serum. Um, if that's not available, then of course urine, because urine is a kind of yeah, uh, yeah, remembrance of what has been in the body and then also the metabolites, um, the presence there can be longer in time, it can be of course more concentrated, it gives you a more over, uh, yeah, better overview with the disadvantage of interpretation because yeah, a urine concentration is difficult to interpret. But as you say, uh, a sample from the liver, a sample from uh, the kidney in, in terms of volatile molecules from the lungs, from, from the brain eventually. And if it's uh, a long time ago or in terms of chronic exposure, uh, be aware that toxicologists also can do these days hair analysis very, very accurately thanks to these uh, high-end uh, mass spectrometer instruments. And the benefit of hair analysis is that it allows, let's say, a view of past drug abuse, not only over weeks, but months and years before. Uh, of course, it will never give an answer to an acute um, uh, death, that's clear, but it gives you an idea with what type of person you are dealing with. Also important for the interpretation in terms of tolerance and addiction, eh? because a blood concentration can be lethal to you and me, who are na uh, naive persons, let's say to methadone or, or heroin, but it can be just therapeutical for somebody uh, who is uh, very much addicted. Um, so that's the, all, all possible samples, in fact, are, are welcome for a forensic toxicologist. Yeah, nice, thanks. Uh, and the last one from Julio Cesar, I think it's more or less in connection with the one sent from Moserling. Uh, what about if there are beneficial uses? Yes, I'm, I'm convinced as a pharmacologist that there are beneficial uses. Um, the difference between an, uh, a molecule being... Uh, so there is a cultural use, and what about bringing... Yes. Can I can I answer Ernesto? Yes, please. Yeah. 
So the difference between a medically, let's say, relevant you know, medication that acts psychotropically or a drug, can, in terms of chemistry, it's almost alike. Eh? Um, there is really, really not much difference. So if people really want to turn into drugs and use them medically, I would say if it is valid, valuable or, or valid as an alternative, provided that uh, it has the consent and, and let's say the uh, supervision by a physician that the molecules that you use are let's say quality control by a pharmacist and that the classical therapy of let's say antipsychotics is not helpful then i have nothing against when people on an individual basis want to rely on what we nowadays call let's say drugs with an, for instance uh, psychedelic action uh, to treat particular disorders Nice, thanks. So I think we have to move on to the next speaker. So thanks, Jan, once again for this very, very nice talk. Uh, so going uh, to the next uh, lecture, uh, it will be presented by Michael Eschner. Uh, Michael, uh, wait. Yeah, Michael is a professor at Albert Einstein College of Medicine, and his main interest, uh, research interests involve molecular pharmacology, toxicology, and neurotoxicology. Uh, and today he will present a lecture entitled The Neurotoxicity of Manganese, What Can We Learn from Worms? Thanks, Michael, and the floor is yours. Uh, Michael, your mic is on mute, I think. Yes. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. Hopefully. Okay. It's only two and a half years since the pandemic started and I'm learning how to use Google Meet, so forgive me. But I was saying thank you, Ernesto, and thank you, Professor Eleni Arantes, for inviting me. Uh, it's a pleasure to share some of the data with you. And as uh, Ernesto said, my presentation today will be on manganese neurotoxicity and what we can learn from worms and hopefully how we can use worms, I'll convince you how we can use the worms, uh, given the fact that there are so many similarities uh, between them and mammalian responses to manganese uh, as an animal model that is alternative and complementary to animal studies. So let me go to my slides. Can you see the slides as well? Yes. Okay, so thank you. Uh, so my talk is basically divided into three <clears throat> different topics. They're all interconnected. I will start with a brevi very brief introduction to manganese, essentiality, and toxicity. And uh, most of my talk will be devoted to the transport of manganese. And I will use a couple of different systems. Uh, I will talk about HeLa cells and one of the manganese exporters. <clears throat> and we'll show you parallel studies that have been done in uh, C. elegans in worms. And then finally, I will show you that uh, we think uh, that the neurotransmitter dopamine is essentially required in order to see the neurodegeneration that is characteristic of manganese induced neurotoxicity. So, so why manganese? I'm always asked why are we studying manganese uh, in the past, the uh, present as well. We've studied other metals such as lead and uh, mercury. And as everybody here knows, those last two metals are not essential. So they're not required for function. They have no biological function. Uh, manganese is different because it is required and uh, I've listed here some of the functions and some of the processes that manganese is involved in. It's important in the metabolism of protein and fats. <clears throat> it mediates immune responsiveness, regulates blood sugar levels. It supports blood clotting in uh, the kidney, uh, in cells in general. It's important in uh, the urea cycle. Uh, it's a cofactor for arginase, and there are many, many other enzymes that are manganese dependent. I'm sure everybody's familiar with the manganese superoxide dismutase, 
which is a very, com very important component of the antioxidant uh, defense systems that uh, is present in every, every cell. Uh, in the brain, there's another enzyme that's very important, which is manganese dependent. Uh, the name of this enzyme is glutamine synthetase, and it's important in maintaining the homeostasis between glutamate and glutamine. Glutamine synthetase converts glutamate to glutamine, which is removing an excitatory amino acid, namely glutamate, and at the same time generating glutamine, uh, which is another essential uh, neurotransmitter. Now, being, uh, being uh, an essential metal, and given the fact that we are all essentially in a steady state, state condition, uh, our relative intake of manganese on a daily basis is not very high. It's about uh, two to nine milligrams per day for an adult. And uh, as you can imagine, given again that we are in a steady state, the amount of manganese that's being absorbed by the gut is relatively small. It's about 3% in adults. It's a little bit higher uh, in neonates. And the diet is indeed the major source of manganese. Uh, we get most of the manganese from green leaves, uh, tea, lettuce. Uh, it's very enriched in, uh, in nuts, for example. Uh, acai has very high levels of uh, manganese, along with the Brazilian nut. So uh, manganese deficiency is actually pretty rare because you don't have to consume meat in order to be uh, manganese replete. Now, in terms of the toxicity, uh, there can be problems if the levels of manganese in the diet are very high. And the other major problem, at least in terms of toxicology, is when individuals are exposed to manganese by way of uh, inhalation. Uh, the lung uh, is not the normal site for the absorption of manganese, and therefore we don't have the same barriers that exist within the gastrointestinal tract. For, so, so for basically the same amount of manganese that's inhaled or absorbed, the rate of uptake of manganese through the lung is significantly higher. And then ma once manganese is in the blood, it's transported to different uh, proteins, uh, by different proteins such as uh, different macroglobulins by uh, transferrin and it is ubiquitous it's present in every cell again given its uh, essentiality now the problem is when individuals are exposed to very high levels of manganese and the target organ for manganese is basically the brain and the area that's most affected by manganese is an area which is important in terms of uh, movement control. Uh, these are areas that tend to have uh, very high levels of iron, and I've listed some of them here, such as cotted putamen, globus pallidus, substantia nigra. Uh, these nuclei are basically known as the basal ganglia, uh, and just as a reference, they are the areas that are known to be affected also in individuals that have uh, Parkinson's disease. Now, what are the risks uh, for the population for manganese exposure? Uh, I won't have time to talk about it, but we did one study in uh, humans, in neonates. Uh, parental nutrition is a risk factor for manganese simply because babies that cannot eat uh, normally or adults that cannot eat normally who are supplemented with parental nutrition receive exceedingly high levels of manganese in the parental nutrition. The other one is iron deficiency, uh, and I'll touch upon this uh, maybe a little bit in the next few slides. Uh, the transporters for manganese are very promiscuous, and, and what do I mean by that? Uh, the transporters are generally not very specific. So the various transporters for iron, for manganese, for other metals tend to be ubiquitous in the sense that they can transport a number of different metals. And DMT, the divalent metal transporter, 
is one such example, and I'll show it to you in the next uh, couple of slides. So when there's iron deficiency, the levels of some of these transporters tend to, uh, the, the levels, the protein levels uh, tend to go down, obviously, mRNA levels tend to go higher, they tend to increase, uh, and as there's an insufficiency or deficiency of iron, these transporters, when they are upregulated, tend to transport other metals, including uh, manganese. So iron deficiency is a very well established factor or risk for increased deposition of manganese. Now manganese is mostly excreted by the liver. So individuals who have uh, cirrhosis or any type of hepatic encephalopathy uh, fail to excrete the manganese, blood levels of manganese by inference increase, and this leads to increased deposition of manganese in the brain and other organs. And then there are a number of environmental causes for manganese exposure. Uh, one of them is high levels of manganese in uh, drinking water. Uh, this is also very prevalent uh, in different regions of different countries. Uh, MMT is another good example. It's, a, it's, a, you know, it's an oxide of uh, manganese. Uh, we seem to be bad students of our history. MMT has been basically a replacement for lead uh, because it's an anti-knock agent, just the way lead was in gasoline. And as you know, it was removed uh, from gasoline, at least in most countries. But now, uh, we're supplementing uh, or adding MMT to the gasoline. It's cheap, it's very efficient, the way it works. And uh, unfortunately, where it's being used, it has been shown that levels of manganese, atmospheric levels of manganese have increased. Welding is another risk factor because this one is uh, welding. Uh, one is using rods for welding the different uh, metal pieces together that are 100% made of manganese. And even if you wear a mask, uh, the masks are not a full face mask. There's uh, a flow of uh, fume, a welding fume uh, through the mask uh, and absorption of uh, all types of different metals, uh, including uh, welding, including manganese. And the last risk factor that I've listed here is a drug of abuse uh, known as methcathinone. It's now being used uh, around the globe. Uh, it's basically a product, uh, ephedrine or pseudoephedrine that's oxidized by potassium permanganate. And it has high level of uh, trace uh, contamination by the permanganate, which is essentially uh, manganese. So uh, methcathinone, there have been some very beautiful papers about methcathinone and manganese deposition uh, in the brain. Now, uh, this just shows manganese levels in human and animal tissues. Uh, and the point that I want to make, uh, you can see here in the red box, red and blue, that uh, the levels of manganese in the brain are actually not the highest in in animal tissues. Uh, for example, uh, you can see if you look at humans, there's much more manganese uh, in the liver, a lot more uh, in the pancreas, a lot more uh, in the kidney, but uh, and the same is true for animals as well. Now, nonetheless, the tissue that seems to be most sensitive uh, to manganese uh, is the brain, and that probably has to do with the place, uh, the area where it's being deposited, and also the, the high uh, metabolic rate of uh, the area, the neurons in the area where manganese is being deposited. So why are we interested in manganese? You probably already have some uh, sense uh, because as I said before, it tends to deposit in areas that have high levels of iron. It is an area that's important in the control of movement and it's an area that is known to degenerate in conditions of uh, Parkinson's disease. And indeed, exposure, exposure to elevated levels of manganese has been shown to cause uh, an irreversible brain disease, which is very similar to Parkinson's disease. Uh, it starts by what's referred to as locura manganica, which is a psychiatric disorder. 
and then it entails an extrapyramidal syndrome uh, with very characteristic symptoms that you find in Parkinson's disease, a movement disorder, dyskinesia, uh, dystonia, stooped type of walking. Uh, again, very, very characteristic of Parkinson's disease, although there are some very distinct differences between manganism or Parkinson's like manganese disorder and idiopathic Parkinson's disease. Okay, so this is all I'm going to say about uh, manganese in terms of uh, the introduction. And next I wanna move into some studies on manganese transport. Uh, first I'll show you some uh, studies on the import of manganese and, and then in worms. And then I'll show you some studies on the export of manganese in HeLa cells and uh, in C. elegans. Uh, so this is a slide that uh, we put together several years ago. And basically everything that you see here around uh, the, the cell membrane are different types of manganese transporters. And the, the question that I've always had and one that I don't have a very good answer for is why do we need so many transporters to control the level of a single metal? Uh, so if you look around, you'll see DMT1, I mentioned it before, the divalent metal transporter one. Uh, you can see that it's a very ubiquitous type of transporter. It's uh, localized on the cytoplasmic membrane and some other organelles. And you could see it can transport manganese, copper, uh, I'm sorry, cobalt, iron, zinc, nickel, uh, there's a ZIP8, ZIP14, again, a very promiscuous transporter that also can transport manganese in the two plus oxidation state. Uh, additionally, it can transport cadmium. <clears throat> uh, there's transferrin, which is a little bit different uh, because it transports uh, manganese in the three plus oxidation state, which is very similar to, to iron, uh, as you know. And uh, this is actually the, the main transporter for uh, iron. Again, coming back to the theme that iron deficiency is associated with increased levels of manganese in the brain and that there's uh, a lot of competition between these various metals and, uh, and, and their uptake on uh, single transporters. Now, we, we don't know, as I said, why there are so many transporters. We also do not exactly know where these transporters are distributed. Uh, I've put most of them here on the cytoplasmic membrane, uh, but we know very little about different transporters at distinct uh, organelles. So, so maybe there's a need for so many transporters in order to control the levels of manganese within individual organelles independent of uh, other organelles and the uptake or efflux of manganese at the level of the cell membrane. So I'm going to start by talking to you a little bit about DMT1, which is an importer of manganese. And then later I'll talk more about SLC3810, which is one of the exporters of manganese. Uh, there's only two known exporters. One of them is SLC 3810, uh, and the other one is uh, ferroportin, uh, again, a transporter which has affinity both for iron uh, and manganese. Uh, the rest of the ones that you're seeing here are basically importers for, for manganese. Okay, so. I know you cannot read this and, and you cannot see it very well, but the point of this slide is just to show you there's a, that there's a very good sequence homology uh, of DMT1 uh, all the way from east, uh, which are shown here at the bottom of each of these panels, east going all the way up to uh, humans, okay? And where you see the light uh, blue color here, here, and here, uh, this is a complete homology between uh, the different, uh, the different uh, species and, and C. elegans is here as well. So the point of this study is just to show you that there is a very good homology between DMT1 
in mammalian systems and DMT1 in C. elegans. And I should clarify that in C. elegans, there are actually three different isoforms of uh, DMT1, which are referred to as SMF1, SMF2, and SMF3. So SMF is basically DMT. Now, the first thing that we wanted to know was the hypothesis was, well, if DMT1 or SMF is a transporter for manganese, then by knocking it out, you should protect the worms from the toxicity of manganese because you are basically eliminating a transporter for manganese. So the, the amount of manganese that would enter the worms should be diminished by way of knocking down or knocking out the transport. So this is what's been done in C. elegans. And as I said, there's three different SMF isoforms, one, two, and three. We generated three different strains where we knocked out SMF1 or SMF2 or SMF3, and we looked at the survival. Uh, so the survival is shown here. Uh, this is a low concentration of, of manganese. And as you would expect in control animals, which is in black, as so you increase the concentration of manganese, the animals are starting to die. And the LD50 or the LC50, the, the lethal concentration that causes death in 50% of the worms is about 47 uh, millimolar of, of manganese. So they are actually pretty resistant uh, to manganese. Now, if our hypothesis was right, that if you knock down SMF 1, 2, and 3, they should become most, more resistant, then you would expect that animals with knockdowns would show a rightwardly shift in the LC50 curve. And this is correct, but it was correct only for two strains. It was correct for SMF1 and it was correct for SMF3. So SMF1 is shown here uh, in blue, the LD50 was about 94. So it's double of what you see in the controls. And the SMF3 are also more resistant now that you've knocked down manganese and there's no way for the animal to maintain the transport of manganese by way of this transporter. Uh, in SMF3, the LC50 is almost three times higher. Uh, remember, this is the log scale is 126 millimolar, which was very surprising to us was that if you knock down SMF2, they actually become more sensitive. And this did not make uh, very much sense at the beginning. So what we decided to do, <clears throat> given these data, is to uh, first of all look at the concentrations of manganese in the different mutants. And as consistent with the previous slide, what we found was that indeed the concentration of uh, manganese in SMF2 knockouts animals was higher than uh, in the wild type animals. Next, we went on to look at the expression of the different uh, DMT1 isoform by using transcriptional and translational GFP fusions and uh, these are different parts of the worms. I'm not going to talk very much about it. I'm just going to focus on uh, the schematic at the bottom of these, each of these slides. Uh, and this just shows uh, the distribution of SMF1 in blue. So you can see that it's pretty much ubiquitous. It's expressed throughout the worms. This is the head. This is what's known as the pharynx region. Uh, the big organ here is the gut, uh, and this is the tail. Uh, so this is obviously the head. Uh, it's also very prevalent under the skin. So SMF1 is basically distributed uh, throughout the worm, and you can see it has a very distinct uh, distribution. Now, when we looked at SMF2, uh, the distribution was very different. Uh, now I will show you where it is, and it's basically just in this region. We couldn't find any SMF2 here. Everything was located in the head region uh, in, in the pharynx. And this is the way it looks. So this is now the head region. All of the SMF2 is here and none of this can be seen. Uh, none of the SMF2 can be seen in other parts of the body, including the gastrointestinal tract uh, and uh, the, the tail area or under the skin. When we look at SMF3 in red, 
Uh, this may look very similar to what I've shown you in SMF1. If it does, uh, you're correct. Basically, the distribution uh, is identical. So without too many details, what does it all mean? Uh, this is a summary slide of our working hypothesis, and this was uh, published a couple of years ago. Uh, basically, we believe that SMF1 and SMF3 are uh, the isoforms that are, uh, have the same function as DMT1 in mammalian system, and namely, they are responsible for the uptake of manganese uh, predominantly from the intestine, whereas SMF2, which is the one that I've shown you is localized only to the pharynx, is much more involved in the sensing of manganese and the regulation of the uptake of manganese by inhibition of the pumping of the pharynx, which is a very important area for the absorption uh, of, of manganese. Okay, uh, now I will spend the next uh, few minutes talking about the predictive value of the worm in understanding the toxicity of manganese in uh, mammalians. And I'm going to revert now to another transporter. Uh, this is SLC3810, which is an exporter of manganese, if, if you recall what I've shown you previously in one of the slides. Uh, so SMF, I'm sorry, SLC3810 uh, got our attention almost 10 years ago now uh, because it was shown in a group of Italian individuals with uh, a mutation or a couple mutations in these transporters uh, to be localized predominantly in the liver and in the brain. Uh, and what was most interesting is that these individuals, uh, when you looked at them at, by MRI, uh, an MRI uh, can be used to look at uh, manganese because manganese is a paramagnetic metal. Uh, manganese accumulated in the basal ganglia, the area that I mentioned before, which is important in movement control. And these individuals had very similar symptoms to Parkinson's disease. So a couple of the mutations which are listed here, a missense and a nonsense uh, shown here in the SLC38 transporter, a six membrane domain transporter, result in symptoms which are very similar to Parkinson's disease and high levels of manganese in the blood. So this caught our attention and what we thought was maybe this is an exporter uh, for manganese. Uh, and we decided to test this hypothesis in both the worms and in HeLa cells, uh, which are cancerous cells derived from a, a, a human, an individual. And the hypothesis was that SLC3810, especially in dopaminergic neurons, which is the area that controls movement in the basal <coughs> ganglia, attenuates manganese-induced neurodegeneration. So when you have a functional SLC3810, it will transport or export manganese from within the cell to the outside. Whereas if you have a mutated form, couple mutated forms, uh, those that have been described in the Italian population or other uh, mutations that can be generated in the lab, that would lead to the aggregation of SLC3810 in the plasma. It will not properly dock within the membrane. And as a result, uh, the levels of manganese in the cell in the warm, the whole organism would be uh, increased. So let me take you through some of the studies that we did. Uh, so this is in HeLa cells. <coughs> uh, what you're doing at here, what you're looking at here in green is wild type SLC30A transporter that has been expressed in the wild type cells. Uh, Connex, I'm sorry, calnexin is basically just uh, a marker for the endoplasmic reticulum. So it looks at the cytoplasm. And this is a merge of these two. So on the outside, you have the green, which is SLC3810. Almost all of it is in the membrane, as you can see, the wild type. Uh, and here is uh, the marker of the endoplasmic reticulum around the nucleus, which is basically uh, black in the middle. 
So now, what happens when you make different kinds of mutations? So here are five samples of uh, different mutations, including the two mutations in the Italian population. And I think you can very much appreciate that the distribution of the mutated forms of SLC30A10 is very different once mutated compared to the wild type. So here, everything is around the membrane pretty much. Here it's very diffuse and it seems to be in the cytoplasm itself. And when you do uh, qualitative work, you can see that almost 100% of the wild type transporter is in the cytoplasmic membrane. So it seems functional, it docks to the membrane. Where else, where, where, where else in the five different mutations, you see almost none of the transporter uh, within the membrane. Uh, we also verified this by doing uh, biotinylation studies, basically doing Western blots uh, by using biotinylation allows you to determine whether a given protein is associated uh, with a cellular, uh, with a cytoplasmic membrane. And the one that we chose is GPP-130, and, and I'll talk about this protein a little bit more uh, in the next slide. Uh, but you can see that when you do a biotinylation study, the SLC3810, the wild type, you get a very nice band, which means basically that's associated, that the wild type band is associated uh, with uh, the cytoplasmic membrane. And when you look at a mutated form of the transporter, there's no band. So it's not associated with the cytoplasmic membrane. Again, consistent with everything that we see uh, in these panels. We use GPP-130 because we know it does not dock to the cytoplasmic membrane and as a positive control, uh, you can see that indeed we do not see uh, a band. So what does GPP-130 do? And I apologize, I know this is a little bit of a busy slide. Uh, GPP-130 is a, is a chaperone for manganese. So, for the le so when the levels of manganese in the cell are very high, GPP-130 takes the manganese from, from the endoplasmatic reticulum, from the Golgi, and it chaperones the manganese to endosomes and lysosomes when, where subsequently the GPP-130 is degraded. So what you have here in red is GPP-130 in control cells. Uh, there's no transfection with the uh, SLC3810. Uh, these are HeLa cells. Now you treat the same cells with very high levels of manganese and you can see that the fluorescence, the GPP-130 fluorescence disappears. Okay, why is that? Because now there's a lot of manganese in the cell. The GPP-130 pulls the manganese and chaperones it to the endosomes and lysosomes and the GPP-130 is degraded. Here we did the similar experiment, but before the treatment with manganese, we also exposed or expressed high level of SLC3810 in the cells. Okay, so again, SLC3810 is in green. We treat with manganese, and now we can preserve the GPP-130. Here it disappeared, here it's preserved. Why is that? The reason for this is that now you do not need the GPP-130 to chaperone the manganese to the endosomes and the lysosomes, because there's a very high complement of SLC3810 within the cell membrane a functional transporter, which can efflux the manganese from the cell, and therefore you can preserve the GPP-130. It's just not being used. So here is the same panel that you're seeing right here, basically the same kind of experiment, wild type SLC3810 being expressed in the cytoplasmic membrane, manganese, is added to the cells. You can preserve GPP-130. And here are the five different forms of SLC-3810 uh, that have been mutated, okay? So now you have SLC-3810. You can see again, it's very different distribution than the wild type. The mutated forms are diffuse and in the cytoplasm. And now when you treat with high levels of manganese, GPP-130 still disappears. Why is that? 
because although you have expressed the transporter, SLC 3810, because it's mutated, it's dysfunctional. It cannot dock within the membrane. And although it's expressed within the cell, you still need the GPP-130 to move the manganese to the endosomes and the lysosomes because the dysfunctional transporter does not have the ability to pump the manganese from within the cell to the outside. Uh, we've done some very simple studies to look at uh, manganese concentrations when we express the wild type and the mutated forms of SLC3810. So these are just control cells. As you'd expect, as you increase the concentration of manganese, the cells are exposed to, the levels of manganese increase. If you express the wild type transporter, you can see that the levels are significantly lower for each of these concentrations. Again, because you have a transporter which is efficient and is able to export the manganese from within to the outside of the cell. Uh, we've done some pulse chase experiments uh, looking at controls, uh, intracellular and extracellular uh, manganese, uh, and you can see when you express a wild type transporter in the cell, the concentration of manganese is lower, consistent with what I've shown you here. The concentration of manganese on the outside is higher. Uh, but when you do the same experiment with a mutated form, you see the opposite results. Again, suggesting that the transporter, once it's mutated, is not able to efflux the manganese from within the cell uh, to the outside. The cells are also more uh, viable when they're exposed to manganese, when you express the wild type transporter. So this is relative viability over manganese concentration. These are control cells. As you increase the concentration, they die. And when you express the wild type transporter, you can see that there is significant difference in the viability. And this likely again reflects the fact that the levels of manganese in these cells are lower uh, as uh, you express the transporter because there is means for the cells to export the manganese. Now, uh, we were also asked to do some studies in neurons, not surprisingly, by the reviewers, and we did so. Uh, so here we took uh, midbrain neurons uh, and we cultured them. Midbrain is again the area that includes the basal ganglia. It's, this is the area that's sensitive to manganese. And we've looked at different parameters uh, in the morphology of these neurons. So we, we looked at longest primary neuride per neuron, total number of primary neurides per neuron and so forth. And we have four different groups. We have the controls, the wild type, and we have the mutated form expressed in these cells. And then we have the same two isoforms, wild type and mutated form, but in the presence of manganese. And you can see that in the absence of manganese, there's no difference between SLC3810 expressing cells in the wild type form versus the mutated forms. But when we expose the cells to manganese, the wild type expressing cells are resistant to the effects of manganese. They basically look like the controls. And this is true for all different panels here versus here, here versus here but the cells that express the mutated form of manganese seem to be much more sensitive. Uh, so they're completely different than the wild type in the absence of, I'm sorry, the mutated form in the absence of manganese and also uh, the wild type in the presence of manganese. Again, suggesting that although the transporter is being expressed because it's mutated, it's not able to excrete the manganese, efflux the manganese and therefore you're seeing all these parameters being affected uh, in the presence of manganese. Now, once we did this, we also wanted to see what's the predictability of uh, the C. elegans model in terms of outcomes of exposure to, to manganese. Mm -hmm. And this was done in, in C. elegans. Uh, they are very small in size. They have a very short uh, life cycle. It's about uh, two days. Uh, and then they live for about 21, 25 days thereafter. 
They're very easy to culture. They eat basically E. coli, which is also very important because it affords one the possibility of knocking out uh, different genes by feeding RNAi to the E. coli, uh, which is then consumed uh, by the worms. Uh, they're very powerful in terms of the genetics. I'm not going to go into it. Uh, they're obviously very small animals and you have to be very careful when you extrapolate from C. elegans to mammalian systems. Uh, I listed here uh, the number of cells. You can see 959 total cells and only about 302 or exactly 302 neurons. And the complete cell lineage is very well uh, characterized there have been actually a number of uh, Nobel Prizes that have been uh, rewarded for work that has been done uh, in C. elegans, uh, uh, including all the work uh, that was originally done on uh, different genes that are associated with uh, apoptosis. So they have about 19,000 genes. And what's important in terms of this talk is that when you look at the function of different genes, you want to make sure that these genes have a similar function in mammalian systems. And that means that uh, the homology between the different genes between C. elegans and mammalian systems has to be high. And uh, generally anything that's over 70% is accepted uh, as being representative of a gene uh, that probably has a similar function in, in, in a human. So these animals are basically, uh, somewhere in between uh, in vitro, which is shown here uh, on the left, and uh, whole organism. Uh, you can query uh, many, many things, obviously anything you might be interested uh, in. And uh, the advantage of it is that this model combines the scale of the high throughput uh, of uh, in vitro screens, uh, but you can still preserve the complexity, the, the, the physiological complexity of traditional animal studies because you are looking at an animal uh, in vivo. So, so the first thing that we did based on what I told you before was to see whether SLC3810 is actually expressed in the worms. And I already told you that when you are looking at genes in C. elegans versus mammalian systems, you want to find genes that have 70% or higher homology. And, and as you can see, uh, we did find five different genes uh, with sequence identity that was similar to the mammalian SLC3810, but none of them reached the 70% uh, threshold. A couple of them were zinc transporters, the other three had unknown function. Uh, but because we did not reach the 70% threshold, what we decided to do was to take human SLC3810 DNA from humans and express it in the C. elegans and then ask questions about the function of these genes. And this, I don't know if it will work. Uh, maybe I could do it in a different way. Can you see this? I hope you can see this. Okay, so so these it's are... It's a black screen. Yeah, that's right. A black screen, okay. Yeah. Can you see it now? There's the movie, the, yeah. the slide of the movie, but uh, I can't see the video at least. At least not here. Oh, you cannot see it. Okay, no, never mind. Uh, I'll go to the next slide. Just let me know if you can see the next slide. Okay. Can you see this? Uh, not yet. Nope. Yeah, now I can. Okay. All right. So what, what we've done here is uh, basically look at different neurotransmitter phenotypes in the worms because we were interested uh, in seeing which of the neurotransmitters is most sensitive to, to manganese. Uh, so I'll change it to red again. 
Okay, so uh, here you're looking at dopaminergic neurons, and I couldn't show you the movie, but uh, basically there are eight, there's only eight dopaminergic neurons. Uh, six of them are shown here, and you can see their projections. This is the head region of the worm. A uh, couple of them are in the tail, and you cannot see them because they're out of this uh, frame. Uh, this looks at uh, GABAergic innervation. You can see it's very different than the dopaminergic in the sense that it seems to be under the cuticle, under the skin, and it crosses from one side of the body to the other. Uh, these are cholinergic uh, neurons. Uh, there are a couple worms here, one and two. Uh, they're more abundant than the dopaminergic neurons, and these are chemosensory neurons in red. Now these are all in the absence of manganese. These are in the presence of manganese. And I think hopefully what you can appreciate is, and I'll show you this in the, in the next slide as well, the only neurons that seem to degenerate upon exposure to manganese are the dopaminergic neurons. Uh, you can see we're losing fluorescence and you can see the puncta, the, the filling within the green color within the axon seems to be much more blurry with puncta. There's all kinds of dots in between the green fluorescence where the fluorescence seems to disappear uh, altogether. So consistent with what we know from mammalian systems, it seems that the dopaminergic neurons in the worm, again, talking about the predictability of the model, uh, what we see is very similar uh, effects in mammalian systems in this, and in this uh, model system. So here's another example with different concentrations of manganese. These are the six different uh, dopaminergic neurons in the head uh, and the projections. This is gonna be the tip of the worm, the nose. And as you increase the concentration, you lose the fluorescence in the axons. And you can see even in the cell bodies, the fluorescence diminishes. And in some uh, soma, in some, in some of the cell bodies, you lose uh, fluorescence altogether. So again, consistent with dopaminergic neuron neurodegeneration. Here we have three different strains of the worms. We have the controls here. We have animals where we express the wild type SLC3810. And here we have animals where we have expressed a mutated form of SLC3810. Uh, the same one that has been described in the Italian population. And it shows uh, neurodegeneration and it shows a, a functional readout, which I'll describe in one minute. So first of all, you can see that the three different strains in the absence of manganese, there appears to be no degeneration of dopaminergic neurons. Okay, they look the same. Now what happens when you start increasing the concentrations of manganese? In the control animals, you have about 50% and neurodegeneration. In the animals where you have expressed a mutated form of SLC3810, the neurodegeneration is even higher, it's about 75%. But in the animals where you have expressed the wild type, the functional SLC3810, there is some recovery compared to the control animals. It's not a full recovery by any means, uh, but the animals seem to do better in terms of neurodegeneration, both at the 10 and 25 millimolar exposure. Now, the nice thing about the worms is that you can also do functional studies to couple the morphological changes uh, with a behavioral outcome. And we know that in worms, uh, one of the behaviors that's being driven or controlled by dopamine is food seeking behavior. So, so the worms basically, I told you before, they eat E. coli. When you put the E. coli <clears throat> on the plate, what they do, like us, they, they move under normal conditions at about 20 body bends for 20 seconds. And when you present them with food, they, they slow down. Okay, just like humans, you usually don't take a sandwich and, and go out running. You usually eat and sit down at the same time. So the worms tend to have the same kind of behavior. You present them with food, they slow down. And what we do here is we calculate the delta, the difference 
in the absence of food and in the presence of food, okay? So if it's the absence of food, it's about 20 body bends per 20 seconds. In the presence of food, it's about 10 body bends per 20 seconds. So the delta is about 10, okay? So this is a readout that you're looking at here. So you can see again that the three different strains, the controls, worms expressing SLC3810 wild type and the mutated forms in the absence of manganese, they all behave the same. You present them with food and the delta is about 10. So what happens when you treat them with manganese? They control animals, the delta is lower, okay? What does it mean? That they keep moving at a very fast rate, okay? Because again, we're looking at delta. So now they're moving at about 16 body bends per 20 seconds. The delta is only four. Uh, so the dopaminergic system is affected. You see neurodegeneration. You see inability to slow down, basal slowing response. They are not able to slow down. Animals that express the human SLC3810, the wild type, have the ability to slow down. The delta is eight. So now they are only moving at about 12 body bends per 20 seconds, okay? So they have been able to slow down. They're almost the same as the controls. And the animals with a mutated form of uh, SLC3810, uh, I'm sorry, do not have this ability to slow down, okay? So they look like control animals. Again, all of this is consistent uh, with the fact that the SLC3810, the wild type, is able to pump out the manganese from the cells and preserve dopaminergic cells from neurodegeneration, which is coupled with the preservation of a functional readout, which is uh, the food seeking behavior or the basal slowing response. And I'll skip this. So basically in summary for this part, uh, our hypothesis is that SLC3810, the wild type, is a cytoplasmic transporter. When it's docked in the membrane, it can very readily move the manganese from inside to the outside of the cell. Whereas when you have a mutant, mute, when you have a mutated form of SLC3810, it has a diffuse appearance in the cytoplasm. It is unable to dock within the membrane. Uh, we don't know exactly where it is expressed, uh, but importantly, it does not have the ability to pump out the manganese as shown here. And therefore manganese levels uh, within the cell, within the worm, within mammalian systems, uh, increase and result in uh, toxicity. And I'm going to spend, what's the time? Do you have a? Yeah. Okay, so let me spend three more minutes on this last part and we'll have a few minutes for questions. I'll talk about the role of dopamine in neurodegeneration. So I already told you that dopaminergic neurons are sensitive to manganese. Uh, I didn't tell you that serotonergic neurons, uh, you cannot see it, but it says uh, serotonin here, are not sensitive to manganese. Okay, so what we decided to do was to ask a very simple question. Is dopamine necessary for the neurodegeneration in the dopaminergic neurons? And how did we decide to do that? So in this table, you see the human genes, the C. elegans genes for dopamine, the C. elegans genes and the human gene for serotonin. And the human genes are listed here. Okay, tyrosine hydroxylase is the rate limiting enzyme in making dopamine. Uh, there's a different gene in C. elegans, the name is uh, CAT2. And the reuptake mechanism for dopamine from the synapse is by way of the dopamine transporter or DAT1. For serotonin, the rate limiting enzyme is tryptophan hydroxylase and the reuptake is serotonin reuptake transporter CERT or mod five in C. elegans. Uh, but I think you can appreciate that both for serotonin and for dopamine, the enzymes are almost exactly the same or the transporters, 
Okay. The only two differences is that to make dopamine, you need CAT2. To make serotonin, you need TPH1 or TPH. To reuptake dopamine, you need that one. And to reuptake the serotonin, you need CERT or MOD5. Everything else is the same. So what did we do? We decided, because we knew serotonergic neurons are not sensitive to manganese, we decided to knock out TPH and MOD5 from the serotonergic neurons and re-engineer them to express DAT1 and CAT2. So now you have serotonergic neurons that don't make serotonin, but they do make dopamine. And the question becomes, once they make the dopamine, are they sensitive to manganese? So these are the methods. Uh, I don't have time, but basically the ADF neurons are uh, serotonergic. This just shows the serotonergic neurons with the GFP for mod 5, the reuptake mechanism for serotonin. Uh, and I'll show you here uh, how we can make, or I, I'll show you that we were successful in making serotonergic neurons uh, make uh, the dopamine. So th these are just BY200s. These are just C. elegans worms that make um, dopamine. So uh, this is stained for GFP for the dopamine transporter. Okay, I've shown you this before. Uh, one important addition that I haven't shown you before is that we have used a formaldehyde induced fluorescence method to look at a dopamine expression in the worms. So I think you can appreciate that the neurons that express GFP for the dopamine transporter also make dopamine. There's a good overlap as shown here. Uh, these are the BN2, which are basically like BY200, these are just uh, wild types. This is uh, the fluorescent for dopamine. When you treat them with manganese, the fluorescence uh, disappears, consistent with what I've shown you before. And this is just to show you that if you're not CAT2, which is the rate limiting enzyme in making dopamine, uh, you see none of these blue dots, okay? The animals are not able to make dopamine because there is no tyrosine hydroxylase or CAT2. And here I'm showing you that now we've made ADF neurons, which are sort of energetic neurons, fluoresce green with uh, the dopamine transporter and they make dopamine, okay? So this new strain is called MAB371. So now we have sort of energetic neurons that make uh, dopamine. Now, I'm not showing you this with manganese because we're still actually doing some studies. I'm showing you this with MPTP, which is a synthetic heroin drug, which is known to affect dopaminergic neurons. And I'm showing you exactly the same assays that I've described before, uh, or the same assay, the neurodegeneration, which is shown here. Uh, you can see that when the ADF neurons or the serotonergic neurons are treated with MPTP, uh, there's no change in uh, their survival. So even at very high concentrations of MPTP, the dopaminergic neurons are not affected by this dopaminergic neurotoxin. But once we make the ADF neurons express dopamine at the same levels of, of MPTP, they significantly degenerate. So dopamine is required for the neurodegeneration that's induced by MPTP. Another way that you can ask the same question is to query whether different strains of worms that have the ability to make dopamine or to reuptake the dopamine from the synapse are sensitive to MPTP or manganese. So here we have four different strains. We have controls in the white, and then we have worms where we knocked out CAT2, so they don't make dopamine. We knocked out DAT1, so they don't have the mechanism for the reuptake of dopamine, and we had a double mutant as well. Both CAT2 and DAT1 were knocked out. And in the absence of manganese, they all look the same. There's no neurodegeneration. 
when we treat the same worms with manganese, the different uh, strains, the controls degenerate, okay, about 40%. The animals that don't have the ability to make dopamine do not degenerate. The animals that don't have the ability to take up the dopamine from the synapse, the DAT1 knockouts and the double knockouts also do not degenerate. And we see both with 10 and 20 millimolar. And we basically see the same thing with manganese. So again, the same four strains, controls degenerate 40 to 50%. And when they don't have the ability to make or reuptake the manganese or the double mutant, there's a much smaller uh, neurodegeneration and they are not significant uh, from the control in the absence of manganese. So in summary, uh, I didn't show you all the data, but exposure to manganese and MPTP results in dopaminergic neurodegeneration. Uh, I think I've shown you that we can make serotonergic neurons uh, make dopamine, and when we do so, they become sensitive to it. Uh, hopefully, I convinced you that the worm is a good model for uh, studying uh, manganese neurotoxicity, uh, any other compound that you might be interested in, and uh, that they are very predictive in terms of outcomes to what we see in uh, mammalian systems. And uh, truth passes through three stages. First, it is ridiculed. Second, it is violently opposed. And third, it is accepted as self-evident. So uh, hopefully we're nearing <clears throat> uh, the third bullet here. And with that, uh, I want to acknowledge uh, the individuals who worked on this project and Albert Einstein. Uh, the work that I've shown you on the HeLa cells was done in collaboration with uh, Dr. Shimshubra Mukapadai and his postdoc uh, Dinora at the University of Texas. And uh, the C. elegans and, and the other work was done in uh, collaboration with uh, my longtime uh, collaborator who's now at Purdue. Uh, Aaron Bowman, and last but not least, uh, the support from the NIH uh, for the work uh, on manganese and methylmercury, which I've not shown you here. And with that, uh, I'll stop. And I'm very happy. I know I'm at three minutes late, so I will let the moderator decide if there's any time for questions. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Michael, for this very nice talk and for presenting this beautiful work. I was very amazed here. Uh, we have two questions from the audience. Uh, I think we can go quickly through them. Uh, the first one is from Paula uh, Devos. Uh, she acknowledges for the presentation. Uh, and the question is, uh, is there any application of the model of C. elegans for other toxic elements or related genes such as SLC? Oh yes, there, there's uh, <clears throat> there's been a lot of work on worms, uh, on uh, various pesticides, for example. Uh, there's been uh, work on C. elegans and you know alcohol. I, I think it's been used as a model for diabetes, Parkinson's disease, disease uh, immune studies. Uh, so I mentioned before the the original work on apoptosis was done on all the genes, the, the BCL, uh, for example. Uh, all these genes were actually discovered originally in C. elegans. They have different names, uh, but there there is a lot of work on copper, on lead. Uh, you know, if we talk specifically about metals, on mercury. Uh, so. It's uh, quite prevalent. I know that some actually federal agencies in the United States, like uh, the FDA, are considering doing studies in C. elegans now as well, sort of as a high throughput screening model before they get into animals with uh, rats or other rodents, just to minimize the use of, of animals. So uh, again, uh, I, I don't know how you familiar how familiar you are with with this system, but. What we have at the University of Minnesota uh, is basically a bank of uh, C. elegans uh, strains. It's a consortium that's run by the university there in Minnesota. 
And when individuals uh, generate new strains, they deposit them in the bank at the University of Minnesota. And anybody who's interested, you know, any, any gene that you might be interested in, uh, if there is a knockout or a knock-in or a double mutant, uh, you can query the, the CGC, which is the consortium. And if this worm exists within the bank, they will send it to you for $10 so that you don't have to regenerate or generate the, the strain if it already exists. Yeah, nice, thanks. Uh, and the second one uh, from Carolina Sanchez. Uh, what are the perspectives for advancing the analysis relating manganese uh, with different tra transport genes? C can you read it again? What, what is the perspective? Yeah, yeah, uh, what, yeah, what are the perspectives for advancing the analysis relating manganese with different transport genes. Okay, so I'm, I'm not sure I fully understand the question. Uh, <clears throat> uh, let me see if I can rephrase it. Uh, uh, what are the perspectives for uh, oh, What are the advances for advancing the analysis? Making a link, I think, uh, when studying manganese with different uh, transport genes the genes that synthesizes these, these transports, so, so, these transporters. You know, the, the way we measure the manganese, there's different ways, but you know, the, probably the most accurate way to measure the manganese is, as, as many of you know, uh, is by ICPMS. So, uh, you know, I, I think doing more refined methodology at this point uh, for trying to localize the different genes vis-a-vis -vis manganese concentrations in different organelles is, is still very difficult. I, other people I know uh, on this in this conference know more about me, but for example, uh, laser ablation ICPMS, I don't think is sensitive enough at this point to determine whether you knock out a given gene, whether it might affect the concentration of manganese in an individual organelle. So it, it might take a little bit more time before we get to uncovering the specificity of the different transporters vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the different organelles, if, if I understood the question correctly. Yeah, I think I think we can we can go with these. Uh, uh, Fernando also has the last one, uh, how to translate neurobehavioral toxicity found in C. elegans to humans. Yeah, so, so I, I said you have to be cautious when you're extrapolating, when you have an animal with uh, eight dopamine neurons and only six in the head. Uh, you know, we, we have millions of those uh, dopamine neurons. Uh, you know, you, you cannot study tremor in, in mice or rats. So obviously you cannot study it also in, uh, which is the characteristic feature of Parkinson's disease. You cannot study it in, in C. elegans, but you can definitely do a lot of behavioral studies that uh, reflect a function. And in some ways it's more simple because individual neurons, uh, human, human behavior is much more complex. In C. elegans, dopaminergic neurons seems to affect reproduction and food seeking behavior. In humans, the dopaminergic neurons affect a lot more than just movement. Uh, we know, for example, that, uh, you know, gambling uh, uh, behaviors are affected by dopamine. So in some sense, I think it's easier. Uh, but, but obviously, you, you know, you have to be very careful in how you uh, extrapolate. There, there's also very sensitive ways of looking at chemotaxis, for example, in worms. Uh, it's very easy to do. Um, you, you put a drop of uh, alcohol in the middle of the plate. What you will find is that the animals that are alcohol naive will very fast move away from, from the alcohol. Whereas animals that have been habituated to the alcohol over time, they, they will actually move towards the alcohol. So, you know, it can be a model, for example, for uh, individual, or it is a model for, um, behavior for, for people who crave alcohol, people that like alcohol, what kind of uh, dopaminergic or other neurotransmitter signals might be involved. So I think there's a value of it. Again, I would not extrapolate from C. elegans, but I think it also gives you 
gives you clues as to what you might want to look at in higher animal species, animals such as rats and, and rodents. Nice, thanks. I think we have to move forward to the last speaker. Uh, so, Professor, if you can please stop sharing your screen. Yeah, I will. Uh, and then okay. can also, yeah. I, I'm, not, I'm not used to Google. I, I signed in yeah. with <laughs> somebody true. else, if you notice. <laughs> Good, yeah, so we're done. Uh, and I think now we can follow to the next speaker, uh, Dr. Monica Maria Bastos Paoliello. Uh, Monica has a bachelor's degree in biological sciences, master's in food science, and a PhD in collective health. Uh, from 1984 to 2014, she was an associate professor at Universidade Estadual de Londrina in Brazil. And since 2017, she's an associate researcher at the Department of Molecular Pharmacology in Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York. Uh, her research in interests are in the areas of occupational and environmental toxicology, human expo exposure to metals, and chemical risk assessment to human health. Uh, and today, she will give the lecture entitled Low Levels of Cadmium Exposure, Blood Pressure and Hypertension in a, in a Urban Population in Southern Brazil. Monica, thanks for your presence and the floor is yours. Muito obrigada, Ernesto, pela apresentação. Eu gostaria também de agradecer a professora Eliane Arantes pelo convite e parabenizá-la pela organização desse workshop. Muito obrigada. Bem, é, minha apresentação, então, será sobre exposição a baixos níveis de cádmio e pressão arterial numa população urbana. É, sabemos que o cádmio é um metal tóxico, amplamente distribuído no ambiente, e a fonte antropogênica é, é mais importante, vamos assim dizer, seria a fonte eh, industrial. Então, eh, a exposição ocupacional ocorreria em procedimentos como revestimento, soldagem, fabricação de baterias, pigmentos de cor. Eh, sabemos também que o cádmio apresenta uma eh, longa meia-vida biológica, principalmente devido à sua baixa taxa de excreção. E essa exposição prolongada pode causar efeitos adversos devido à acumulação desse metal, desse metal em órgãos e tecidos como rins, fígado, incluindo o sistema nervoso central e periférico. E mesmo a baixos níveis de exposição foram identificados é, alguns efeitos cardiovasculares como a doença arterial periférica, mortalidade e hipertensão, entre outros efeitos adversos. É, sabemos também que é, o cádmio pode aumentar a, a permeabilidade da barreira hematoencefálica e, em estudos experimentais, altera o sistema renina-angiotensina, podendo causar, levar a uma hipertensão. É, as principais fontes de cádmio numa população geral, ou seja, não exposta ocupacionalmente ao cádmio, seria o hábito de fumar, que é, sem dúvida, é, a fonte de exposição mais prevalente né, da, da exposição ao cádmio. E no caso de não fumantes, a dieta é importante, como o consumo de moluscos, miúdos, né, vísceras e alguns vegetais. E além disso, alguns estudos identificam que pessoas mais velhas, idosos, podem apresentar níveis de cádmio em, em sangue mais elevados do que uma população mais jovem. Como avaliamos a exposição ao cádmio? Podemos usar como biomarcador os níveis de cádmio em sangue, que reflete principalmente uma exposição recente, ou ainda os níveis de cádmio na urina, que vai refletir uma exposição é, mais a longo prazo. <risos> É, 
O nosso estudo é um estudo epidemiológico transversal, realizado com adultos de 40 anos ou mais, que, mo que moravam numa cidade no norte do estado do Paraná, aqui, que é o município de Cambé. É, esse município, basicamente, é baseado uh, uh, no agronegócio, especialmente soja, mas também tem várias pequenas e médias empresas de solda e de usinagem. É, antes de nós iniciarmos o nosso estudo em Cambé, um estudo piloto foi realizado para validar o nosso, é, ban, é, o nosso questionário e padronizar as medidas que obtivemos, como peso, altura e pressão arterial. Fizemos uma trajetória randomizada, aleatória, e as casas eram selecionadas, usamos um mapa, né, e as casas eram selecionadas no intervalo de um para dois. Então, nós, nós é, é, entrevistávamos os participantes que moravam na primeira ou na segunda, iniciávamos cada bloco é, por, um, por um sorteio, na primeira ou na segunda casa, nós iniciamos a, a coleta de dados, caso houvesse participantes com 40 anos ou mais, pulávamos uma casa e é, entrevistávamos da outra, e assim por diante. Tudo isso para que a gente pudesse evitar a concentração desses respondentes, desses participantes, em certas ruas ou em certos quarteirões do município de Cambé. Fizemos é, é, entrevistas individuais nas casas, então, dos participantes, e após a entrevista nós marcávamos um horário e dia para coleta do material biológico que foi feita nas unidades básicas de saúde do município. É, o tamanho da amostra foi baseada na prevalência de doenças cardiovasculares e na predominância da população na área urbana do município. 96% da população de Cambé morava na cidade, não na área rural. Então, na altura, Cambé tinha aproximadamente 93 mil habitantes, agora tem um pouquinho menos, eu creio, e 33% tinham 40 anos ou mais, né, que correspondia a quase 31 mil. Então, com, com uma razão é, de prevalência de 50%, uma margem de erro de 3%, com um intervalo de confiança de 95%, nós chegamos nesse tamanho de amostra. Entretanto, quem faz estudo epidemiológico com população sabe muito bem que nós temos perdas, que nós temos é, recusas. Então, nós aumentamos em 25% da nossa amostra, prevendo essas perdas e essas recusas. Né? E chegamos nesse, nesse número. Tá? As variáveis que nós trabalhamos e estudamos fomos as variáveis demográficas, variáveis de saúde e socioeconômicas. A, a variável socioeconômicas, nós usamos a classificação da ABEP, que divide em classes A e B, C, D e E, no caso de A e B para é, renda mais alta, D e E para pessoas com renda mais baixas. E, além disso, é, trabalhamos com variáveis relacionadas à dieta e ao estilo de vida. Então, por exemplo, a questão do hábito de fumar, consumo de álcool e a ingestão de vegetais e leite, por exemplo. Tá? É, nós utilizamos o ICPMS para fazer as nossas análises numa sala limpa, com, equipada com um fluxo laminar. Um total de três medidas da, da pressão sistólica e diastólica foram feitos em cada voluntário, né, durante a, as nossas visitas, é, de acordo com uh, os guidelines da Sociedade Brasileira de Hipertensão. Tá? 
É, para a definição de hipertensão, nós seguimos os seguintes parâmetros. Quem tinha uma pressão diastólica igual ou mais alta de 90 milímetros de mercúrio e ou uma pressão sistólica igual ou acima de 140, ou ainda eram classificados como hipertensos aquelas pessoas que utilizavam medicação é, antihipertensiva. Nós pedíamos para que as pessoas é, trouxessem todas as caixinhas dos remédios que essas pessoas consumiam, porque muitas não, não sabiam que tipo de medicamento utilizavam, né, algumas dessas pessoas. Então, nós tínhamos essa prática de pedir que o voluntário trouxesse todas as caixinhas, os medicamentos que eles tomavam. É claro que foi envolvido ó, todo o município, a prefeitura, a secretaria de saúde, foi orquestrada toda para a coleta de amostras, tanto biológicas como a coleta de dados, e todo participante assinou um, um consentimento livre e esclarecido é, para antes da coleta do material, tanto de sangue quanto dos dados. Então, com relação aos nossos resultados, né, os testes de hipóteses, os testes de significância, mostraram que os homens apresentavam níveis de cádmio em sangue mais estatisticamente mais elevados do que as mulheres, não obtivemos significância com relação à idade, ou educação, ou classe econômica, mas obtivemos diferenças entre aqueles que nunca fumaram, os que fumaram no passado e os fumantes, diferenças significativas nos níveis de cádio no sangue, também com relação à ingestão frequente de bebidas alcoólicas, né, os que ingeriram bebidas alcoólicas apresentavam níveis mais altos do que os que não ingeriam com frequência, e a ingestão de leite, pessoas que ingeriam maior, maiores quantidades de leite, eh, diariamente, apresentavam níveis mais baixos de cádmio em sangue. Com relação à pressão diastólica, observamos que eh, as pessoas com pressão diastólica mais altas apresentavam níveis mais altos de cádmio em sangue, também estatisticamente mais altos. Aí nós partimos para uma análise de regressão múltipla, fizemos a razão das médias geométricas, dos, de acordo com as é, variáveis socioeconômicas e de estilo de vida, e verificamos que é, os homens apresentaram, podemos ver aqui pelo intervalo de confiança, que não engloba o 1, estão acima, é, esses valores acima de 1, então, os homens apresentaram níveis mais altos do que as mulheres, entretanto, isso não se manteve na, na, na análise ajustada. Nós ajustamos aqui por todas essas variáveis. No primeiro momento, parece um superajuste, né, um hiperajuste, mas, na verdade, nós testamos vários ajustes e esse foi o modelo que, que é, é, foi melhor. Observamos também que o hábito de fumar, tanto na análise não ajustada como na análise ajustada, é, apresentaram associação com os níveis de chumbo em cádmio. Nós podemos observar aqui que tanto no caso de aqueles que já pararam no, dos ex-fumantes e dos fumantes atuais, né, houve associação com o cádmio. No caso do hábito de beber, nós também obtivemos associação que não se confirmou na análise ajustada e também obtivemos, é, no caso daqueles participantes que consumiam é, mais leite durante a semana, é, tinham também uma associação, é, aqui no caso um efeito protetor, né, um inter, com esse intervalo de confiança, mostrando um efeito protetor do leite, Entretanto, nós não obtivemos 
é, esses resultados na análise ajustada. Podemos ver aqui também que é, quando trabalhamos com, com a regressão, é, análise de regressão múltipla, nós não tivemos nenhuma associação tanto para pressão sistólica, diastólica e hipertensão. Comparando um pouco os nossos resultados é, com os resultados que nós obtivemos em outros é, locais do Brasil, é, no caso do estado do Acre, tá, Freire e colaboradores obtiveram essa média geométrica e uma associação dos níveis de cádmio em sangue com a raça, com o hábito de fumar e relacionado com a educação mais baixa. É, Nunes é, foi no estado de, acho que foi até um estudo do Fernando, é, do Pará, no Pará, né, um aluno, de um aluno do Fernando Barbosa, eu creio, é, o, é, encontrou uma associação entre cádmio e hábito de fumar em vários estados. Nunes fez um trabalho em vários estados. Rubia Cuno, em São Paulo, é, obteve uma associação entre cádmio e, e sexo masculino e idade. Pessoas mais velhas apresentavam níveis mais altos. E a Carmen Kira, também em São Paulo, uh, obteve uma associação com idade, sexo, hábito de fumar e ingestão de álcool. É, é, nós, assim, concluímos que o chumbo no, cante, no, no sangue foi considerado um bom biomarcador, tanto o no nosso estudo como os outros estudos. No teste de hipótese, nós tivemos associação com esses parâmetros, sexo, hábito de fumar, consumo de álcool e de leite, e também com a pressão diastólica, e é, com relação aos níveis de chumbo em sangue e a pressão diastólica, os possíveis mecanismos estariam relacionados com a, a oxi, a, o estresse oxidativo, a geração de espécies, de espécies é, oxidativas, a, um, uma, um discurso na sinalização do cálcio, dano renal, já comentei sobre a interferência do sistema renina angiotensina, além de disfunção endotelial. É, com relação à, à relação entre os níveis de chumbo em sangue, é, com o hábito de fumar, de beber, e o, aqueles que não consumiam é, é, quantidades semanais de maiores de leite, também foi obtido em, na literatura. E no nosso estudo, nós não obtivemos né, nenhuma relação nos estudos de, de regressão múltipla, nenhuma associação entre altos níveis de, de cádmio em sangue e, e pressão sistólica, diastólica e hipertensão. É, também Está claro que o hábito de fumar é uma, uma fonte conhecida de, de cádmio, tá? E os cigarros, é, fumaça dos cigarros podem gerar altas concentrações de cádmio. E com relação a, aos que ingeriam bebidas alcoólicas com frequência, é, o consumo de álcool em estudos é, em animais experimentais mostraram um aumento da retenção né, do cálcio no, no organismo e também é, com a elevação de, das concentrações de metalutioneínas, tanto no fígado como é, nos rins. E a gente sabe que a metalutioneína é uma proteína de baixo peso molecular, rica em cisteína, e é, estudos mostram que a expressão da toxicidade do cádmio está relacionado com o balanço entre uh, o cádmio ligado à metalotioneína, à, à tioneína, e o cádmio não ligado, especialmente no tecido renal. Com relação ao consumo de leite, né, que foi negativamente associado aos níveis de chumbo 
em, de, desculpa, de cádmio em sangue, né, foi verificado em estudos que é, o leite pode reduzir a, a absorção de cádmio, né, e que existe também evidências, né, que é, uma dieta pobre, baixa, é, é, em, em leite, pode resultar numa alta taxa de absorção gastrointestinal como consequente acúmulo do cádmio, tá? Os estudos mostraram isso, certo? É, com relação à exposição ao cádmio, a baixos níveis de cádmio, né, gostaria de lembrar, né, que os nossos níveis foram bem baixos, uma população urbana, mas é, essa, é, resultados conflitantes nós temos encontrado entre níveis de cádmio e pressão arterial, né, e seu papel na hipertensão. Então, em seguida desse estudo, nós fizemos uma revisão sistemática, né, para avaliar a relação entre a exposição ao cádmio e a pressão arterial e hipertensão. E nesse estudo que seguiu a esse nosso estudo de Cambé, nós é, selecionamos 358 artigos, né, 71 foram avaliados, desses 71 foram excluídos 33 artigos por uma série de, razo de razões, e no nosso, na nossa revisão sistemática foram incluídos 38 estudos, e as nossas conclusões, né, desse estudo, que a, a literatura suporta uma relação positiva entre os níveis de cádmio em sangue e a pressão arterial, mas é, existe um número bastante limitado de estudos populacionais, e principalmente os que não incluíam fumantes. E, além disso, um, um número muito limitado de coortes, né, de estudos prospectivos. Então, nós concluímos nessa revisão sistemática que mais estudos é, seriam necessários para confirmar se baixos, é, é, exposições a baixos, baixas concentrações de cádmio pode levar a uma alteração da pressão arterial, tá? Então, com relação ao nosso estudo, esse foi um estudo de base populacional, onde nós utilizamos várias medidas antropométricas, né, e socioeconômicas que pudessem nos ajudar a entender esse quadro. É, foi muito bem padronizada as nossas medidas de pressão arterial, usamos método analítico <coughs> precisos, né, e, lógico, a limitação do nosso estudo, esse é um estudo de base transversal, então, os estudos transversais não nos dão uma, uma, é, uma relação temporal, não determina uma relação temporal dessas associações, nem uma causalidade, né? E também seria muito interessante se nós tivéssemos incluído uh, as análises, o biomarcador, o, o a cádmio na urina nas nossas análises. E para quem quiser mais é, detalhes sobre esse nosso estudo, ele foi publicado agora em 2020, e eu gostaria de agradecer a todos, especialmente a Ana Carolina Almeida Lopes, Ayrton da Cunha Martins Júnior, Júnior e outros nossos colaboradores, tanto da uh, Universidade Estadual de Londrina, Instituto Adolfo Lutz, Albert Einstein e, e a professora Ellen, que na altura ainda estava na Johns Hopkins, hoje ela é professora emérita, aposentada, e eu gostaria de agradecer também a atenção de todos e, mais uma vez, a, ao convite para participar desse workshop. Muito obrigada. Obrigado, professora Mônica, pela, pela palestra, bem interessante também. Uh, eu queria pedir para você, antes, para a senhora parar a apresentação, senão o pessoal que está vendo a transmissão não consegue ver. Ah. Nem eu, nem você, quando a gente faz as perguntas. Obrigado. <risos> uh, 
A gente tem três perguntas uh, da audiência lá no, da, lá no YouTube. Eu vou começar com a primeira da Paula. Uh, ela agradece a apresentação. Uh, e nos estudos, vocês constataram alguma coexposição do cádmio com outros metais da população exposta? Uh, e isso poderia influenciar de alguma forma nos resultados? É, é uma ótima pergunta, Paula. É, nós temos poucos estudos é, é, a respeito, epidemiológicos a respeito de exposições simultâneas. Sim, nós fizemos é, outros estudos, mais oito ou nove, não estou bem lembrada, metais, mas nós não fizemos ainda nenhum estudo de correlação e de associação é, e nós estamos é, realmente trabalhando com outros metais também e vendo essa possibilidade, mas muito boa a colocação, essa sua. Obrigada, Paulo. Perfeito, professora. A próxima é do Júlio César. Ah, vocês somente usaram cigarros tradicionais para o estudo uhum. ah, e existem alguma perspectiva do uso de cigarros eletrônicos e outras formas de fumo, como palha, narguile, maconha, com o acúmulo de cádmio? Pois é, uma ótima pergunta também, mas infelizmente nós só estudamos a questão do, do cigarro tradicional, e eu acho que estudos em que envolvam principalmente o cigarro eletrônico, que hoje está sendo muito usado, tanto pela população mais jovem, adulta, etc., é, seria um, daria um bom estudo. Mas nesse nosso estudo, é, apenas o cigarro tradicional foi estudado, foi categorizado. Tá certo, obrigado. Ah, e a última, da Isabela. Ah, professora, qual a maior dificuldade na realização de estudos populacionais como esse que vocês fizeram? Eu fiquei pensando a mesma coisa aqui, por sinal. É, Isabela, o, os estudos populacionais, eles, é, eles demandam mais tempo, eles são mais longos, depende do estudo, mesmo um estudo transversal, ele exige, é, por exemplo... Eu, eu fiz no, na minha tese, eu trabalhei em áreas de mineração no meu doutorado, depois é, em um, um outro estudo populacional em Londrina, agora esse em Cambé. Então, a primeira coisa é o tempo, né? É, é, essas análises, é, nós contamos com participantes, então existem muitas recusas, que é natural, é, existe o... o com relação ao tempo demandado para o contato com uh, os órgãos oficiais, a gente não pode fazer um estudo epidemiológico sem aprovação de um comitê de ética e sem o aceite, não apenas da população, mas no caso da Secretaria de Saúde, da Prefeitura, nós temos que ter muito cuidado também na comunicação do risco, é fundamental a devolução é, desses estudos, é, a população, né, numa forma, numa linguagem importante, numa linguagem para leigo, é, é desafiador, mas ao mesmo tempo eu gosto muito, eu, eu fico muito satisfeita de, de, de fazer estudo epidemiológico com todas essas dificuldades, né, que a gente tem, e, e, a, e logística também, coleta de amostras, de material biológico, mesmo a coleta, por exemplo, nesse nosso último estudo, é, cada entrevista durava pouquinho mais de uma hora. Né? Então, é, é, é trabalhoso, é complicado, mas ao mesmo tempo é fascinante. Obrigada pela pergunta. Eu acho que essa deve ser uma das partes mais gostosas deve ser realmente esse retorno que a gente dá, né? Que a gente coleta dados de uma população e depois você consegue mostrar para eles o que, que você fez com esses dados e talvez dar até algum ensinamento, né? Tipo, de coisas para melhorar a, a vida da, da população. Acho que isso é bem, bem bacana. Exatamente. E, Ernesto, uma coisa que eu aprendi, eu tive uma experiência muito ruim no meu meus primeiros primeiro estudo epidemiológico na minha tese de doutorado, que nós estávamos preparando toda a comunicação do risco e tivemos uns terceiros é, comunicando o risco de uma forma errada. E, assim, eu, eu gostaria de chamar a atenção. A primeira coisa, 
é importante, porque depois se, se há comunicação de um risco de uma forma errada, ou, ou é, é, depois é muito difícil de consertar isso. Então, é, para quem é, pretende fazer um estudo epidemiológico, que é, trabalhe, que veja muito bem quais são os valores da população, é, como essa população entenderia esse retorno, né, para que, e também, né, lembrando do retorno a pro, aos próprios órgãos governamentais, as prefeituras, é, porque eles estão sempre avaliando riscos, não é verdade? Então, os nossos estudos contribuem para uma melhor avaliação do risco pelos órgãos governamentais. Obrigado. Exatamente. <risos> Obrigado, professora. Uh, bom, eu não recebi mais nenhuma pergunta por aqui, então eu acho que a gente pode encerrar essa, essa apresentação e também encerrar o workshop, que eu não sei para vocês, mas para mim foi um dia de aprender muito, foi muito interessante, eu gostei muito de, de ter participado. Uh, e, pessoal, quem está assistindo no YouTube, lembra de preencher a lista de presença Uh, a gente teve um problema para mandar o link, o YouTube simplesmente não deixou a gente mandar um endereço, uma, um, uma URL pelo, pela conversa, a gente colocou de uma maneira quebrada, então se alguém não entendeu ou não está conseguindo acessar, por favor, uh, avisa a gente, tá bom? E eu agradeço novamente a presença de todo mundo, obrigado professora Mônica, thanks Jan, and also thanks uh, Michael for being here, it was very nice. Uh, and by this, with this, I, I will close our section. Thanks everybody for watching and for participating in our workshop. <laughs>